Something surprising happened during the commission of this crime. If you witness the crime, then you'll know what the surprise involved. Did it involve an alarm? No. A mouse? No. A janitor? No. Some chimes? No. A bat? No. Okay, well that concludes our little demonstration. I'm going to turn the machine off now. Let me ask you why you're turning the machine off and unhooking it. You didn't ask any of the questions I thought you would. I thought you'd ask questions, did I do it, or was I the person who abducted dead Ernie? You didn't ask those questions. That's right. That's the kind of question that you're, you normally ask in a conventional lie detector test, the, the question that gets at, did you do it? Did you yeah. commit the crime? The problem with that kind of question is that for some people, just being asked the question makes them anxious. Nice. And as a result, they give a strong response and they look guilty. The nice thing about the guilty knowledge test, which is what we used, is that it protects innocent people because mm -hmm. only the person who is aware of the facts of the crime would give a physiological response to the right alternative. A person who didn't see the videotape, for example, wouldn't know which answer it was and their physiological activity would mm -hmm. indicate that. So you have an alternate kind of test. Let's look at the results. We, we, I took the test before. This was just a demonstration. And I took the full test. And let's see how I did on some of the questions. Here we have questions one through five. What do these little squiggly lines mean up here? OK, well, here's the first question. And if you remember, the first question had to do with what room was broken into. Mm -hmm. And here's the multiple choice alternatives for each item. When the question was asked, we get a large response here. And this is confined to the galvanic skin response channel, the only one we're looking at here because it makes it simple. And you can see the responses clearly. Okay. The first alternative we don't pay any attention to because that elicits a surprise sometimes when people are asked. So we just focus on B through E. The correct answer here was B, a biology lab, and you can see the largest responses there. Sure. Now, uh, question number three, which one was that one? Well, the third question had to do with what was broken during the commission of the crime. And the correct answer was C, a glass beaker, and again, that's where the largest response is. And so forth, we can see large responses. Let me get quickly to the innocent question, number four. What happened in this question? Well, this was the question that had to do with what surprising thing happened during the crime. The correct answer was B. Uh, that a mouse was present, and in this instance, you can see there is no response to B, and there are large responses to other items. So in this case, uh, you beat the test. I know, I know. Actually, what I did on this one was I bit on my tongue until it was painful, and I sort of thought I could fool the machine. Did I, in fact, fool yes, the machine? Yes, you did fool the machine. You were successful, and it looks like you didn't even respond to the correct alternative, which was mouse, and that's probably because you weren't focusing your attention on that, but rather were preparing mm -hmm. to beat the test by biting your tongue. All right, now, given the fact that I was able to prove some innocent questions, although I was guilty on most of them, what does that say about lie detector tests? Well, exactly how accurate a lie detector test is is a controversial and complex issue about which there's great disagreement. Everybody agrees, though, at least scientists agree, that there's, uh, there are mistakes made and that it's more likely that an innocent person will fail the test and less likely that a guilty person will pass the test. But exactly how many mistakes are made, uh, there's mm -hmm. disagreement about that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Iacono, for shedding uh, the light and the truth on a very controversial issue. And we'll be right back in just a minute. Trivia. Fascinating fact number 180. Eels. An electric eel can produce a shock of up to 650 volts, five times the strength of a common household outlet. That's enough to kill a person on contact or stun a horse. The adult eel is blind and uses its electricity to locate and kill its prey. Slice another one. You know, in addition to the power provided by the golfer, the golf ball has to be engineered correctly to make a good shot. A fact noticed by some of our viewers who wondered why a golf ball looks the way it does. Kendall Putnam of Pasadena, California, and Jay Ryan of Chicago, Illinois, wrote and asked, why does a golf ball have dimples? You ever wondered why? Well, to answer that question, we first set up a test. 
And our test begins out here on the golf driving range. Let's see why a golf ball has dimples. To do that, I have two kinds of golf balls in my hand. One here, I have a regular dimpled golf ball. And in this hand, I have a clean shaven golf ball. There are no dimples on this ball. So the best way to find out why a golf ball has dimples is to hit both of them. See what happens. First, I'm going to hit the golf ball, the regular one, with the dimples. Well, on the average, the dimpled golf ball went about 150, 200 if I'm lucky. Now, let's see what happens when we try to hit the ball without the dimples. The dimpleless ball really didn't go very far, oh, maybe 100 yards. Now, is this a good test? Well, I'm certainly not Jack Nicholas and hitting a golf ball, but in actual control tests, balls with dimples went two, two and a half times further than golf balls without dimples. Here to explain why is sports physicist Dr. Richard Brandt of New York University. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Brandt. I'm happy to be back. Let's get right to the question. Why do the dimples make the ball fly further? Well, a golf ball has dimples for the same reason that an airplane has wings. <laughs> really, it makes it go much farther. Really? Now, why is that? Let's see this in the wind tunnel. Okay. You see, we have one of those ball golf balls there with no dimples. I turn on the wind coming from this direction, so it's as if the ball were moving in this direction. So even when it spins quite rapidly, what happens? Not a whole lot going on in there. Right, hardly any motion at all. That's because a golf ball needs dimples in order to grab the ear and force it down and respond upwards. All right, now, what are you going to do? Can you put a dimple ball in there? Sure, I'll put this dimple golf ball in right now. All right, while you're doing that, maybe you can tell us a little history of golf balls. Sure, look at the ball in front of you there. That's from the 1850s, and wow. you can see it has no dimples. Very pretty, very smooth. Now, why did somebody start to think about putting golf uh, dimples on the golf balls then? People noticed that when balls were nicked or cut or roughened, they went mm. farther. Mm -hmm. That's what made people realize that a rough surface would be beneficial. So the first dimples came on the golf ball went? About 1908 by the Spalding Company in this country. All right, you got your uh, golf ball set up there? Okay, here Let's we have it. the dimpled golf ball. Okay. You put it in place. All right, set now it up. Now turn on the wind, turn on the spin. Now watch what happens. Wow, it goes right up. That's right. If we look at it slowly, you see that the ball has what we call bottom spin. Bottom spin. It's rotating in that direction, grabbing the air coming in this direction, pulling it down, and rebounding upwards. All right, let's look at a, a computer graphic you made for us about that. Right, that'll show it more clearly. We see the ball moving to the right. Mm -hmm. The air is coming around. But because of the direction of spin, the air on top is going faster than the air on the bottom. This means, according to Bernoulli's principle, that the pressure on top is going to be less than the pressure on bottom. So the greater pressure on the bottom keeps the ball up. So in effect, the air sort of piles up at the bottom of the ball, and it's sort of sucked through at the top, so the ball gets pushed up. Precisely. Now, uh, why don't they just put a lot of dimples on a golf ball then? Well, you <laughs> have to control the depth of the dimples, because the deeper they are, the more drag there is. And that's mm -hmm. bad, but the more lift there is, and that's good. So you have to compromise this good and bad effect and achieve some happy medium. Now, what would happen if I put a top spin on the ball? Oh, then it would just plummet to the ground. That's the spin on a curveball, as you know, from when I was here last time. I see. And that drops fast. So then if you put top spin on a golf ball, it's going to dive like a curveball. That's right. It's hard to do that, of Listen, course. if you've seen my shot, you know that's not hard. I, I know you could do it. <laughs> all right, now what about some of the other weird shots you, golfers make all the time? Certainly the slice, which drags it to the right. That's right. That's responsible for the motion going to the right, yeah. because if the ball is rotating mm -hmm. left or right instead of up and down, the ball will go left or right. So if we, we hit it off center and hit it, spin it to the right, it's going to go to the right? That's right, and that'll be a slice. And if I spin it the other way? It'll be a hook. a hook. Okay, let's talk about other factors affecting golf balls then. Okay, let's take a look at some of these balls here to understand an important factor in the flight of a golf ball. The mm -hmm. so-called coefficient of restitution. Mm, sounds That's, serious. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not as serious as it sounds. It's a measure of how much of the rebound speed a ball maintains mm. when it bounces. All right. Here's a super ball with a high coefficient of restitution. Give it a bounce. Ooh. 
came right back up. Right. That has a coefficient of restitution of about 90%. Wow. The golf ball is next at 70%. Not quite as high. It's only 70%. Right. Here's a baseball with a coefficient of restitution of 50%. Whoa, let it get away there. Okay. Not very not, far. Not much of a bounce. Try this one, a ball of putty. <laughs> that has a coefficient of restitution of zero. What other kind of factors, then, are involved in uh, getting the ball to work right? Other relevant factors are the weight of the club, the weight of the ball, the speed of the club, and the size of the ball. Mm -hmm. All these things together determine the trajectory of a golf ball. So with all that physics knowledge, I should be able to... Uh, Hit a good drive next time, get a good distance and straight. Right, and if you're still having trouble with your slice, here's something I recommend you use. <laughs> it's an <laughs> illegal ball. It, what? what do you mean it's illegal? You see, the dimples are d deeper around the top than on the side. Oh, they are, yeah, they're deeper in here than they are on the side. Right, the USGA requires the dimples be placed symmetrically in any legal golf ball. So this will prevent me from hooking or slicing. That's right, yeah. if you put it on the tee correctly, then you'll get the same lift, but no hook or slice. All right, thank you, Dr. Brand, very much. I'm going to try this one out here. Good luck. <laughs> we'll be right back right after uh, I tee up for the next segment. <laughs>